Welcome to the very first episode of Analyzing Evil. Today we'll be discussing the character that gave me the inspiration to start this channel in the first place. The character of Colonel Kurtz, as portrayed by Marlon Brando in the film Apocalypse Now. As a disclaimer, many of the themes in Apocalypse Now are not for the faint of heart, and this video may be a bit graphic. To get a better understanding of our character, we must first briefly explore the source of Francis Ford Coppola's inspiration for making this film, and for the character of Kurtz, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. This novella has been analyzed and picked apart many times over the last hundred plus years, and if you're looking to better identify yourself with the themes and contents of not just this video, but the film Apocalypse Now, I suggest you give it a read or watch one of the many videos and lectures about it you can find online, giving a full breakdown of the book. In the book, Kurtz is not a military man. Rather, he is an ivory trader during the Belgian rule of the Congo, which was then known as the Free State of Congo. Kurtz is talked about in the first chapter of the book as an amazing man, one who will surely rise high in the company that the narrator, Marlowe, is a part of. As we read further into the book, we discover that Kurtz has gone off the rails due to a suspected illness. The narrator, upon finding Kurtz, discovers that he has set himself up as a sort of deity that is being worshipped by the natives. Kurtz has gone mad from the illness, but also from being isolated in the jungle for a long period of time. The darkness referred to in the title of the book is the jungle, and Kurtz has remained in the center of it for so long that he's become mad and begun using methods that the company considers unsound. This is only a very brief description of the character of Kurtz from the Heart of Darkness, as today the main focus of this video is the character of Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. If you'd like an analysis of Heart of Darkness Kurtz, let me know in the comments below and I may feature him in a future video. Now on to the main event. In the beginning of the film, the main character Captain Willard is given a briefing on Colonel Kurtz. He has played two recordings that are allegedly made by Kurtz. In the first recording, Kurtz describes a dream or a nightmare he has been having in which a snail crawls along the edge of a straight razor, yet still survives. The second recording is then played of him saying, and I quote, We must kill them. We must incinerate them. Pig after pig. Cow after cow. Village after village. And they call me an assassin. What do you call it when the assassins accuse the assassin? They lie, and they lie, and we have to be merciful to those who lie. I hate them. I do hate them. This is our first encounter with Kurtz, so to speak, and we can gleam a few key things initially about his state of mind from these recordings. Now the dream he describes in the first recording can and has been interpreted in many different ways. These first lines of dialogue are meant to paint us a faint portrait of Kurtz in our minds early on, and the dream is perhaps the most important of the two recordings in achieving this for the viewer. In my opinion, the most rational way to interpret the meaning of his dream is to first review the second recording in order to understand his dream. In the second recording, Kurtz is describing the methods he feels are necessary to bring the war to a swift end, and vilifying those who call him a villain, the U.S. military. A large part of the reason the United States was unsuccessful in Vietnam was due to their failure to adapt to the situation and instead attempting to fight the war as they had fought many wars in the past. Kurtz realizes this and feels the best way to fight the war is a more personal and measured approach. With the information we obtained from the second recording and one more key fact, and that is that a snail is able to actually survive while crawling on the edge of a straight razor. We can deduce that the snail is the United States military, and the razor is Vietnam. While the snail will survive, it gains nothing by being in this situation, neither losing nor winning anything. It simply just is. I feel this is an accurate way to describe the ultimate outcome of the Vietnam War for the United States. While we lost a great number of lives, the United States as a whole did not lose as much as other countries have during times of war like for example the Soviet Union during its time in Afghanistan. To Kurtz, this is unacceptable, as later on we'll see that his career is very distinguished 
and he has found victory in virtually every situation he has ever been in. He's seeing the institution he's dedicated his life to fail. Fail to adapt to a new situation, and thus ultimately failing in its main goal, victory. This, to Kurtz, is nothing short of heresy. Now, as I said before, there are many different interpretations of this particular quote, and if you feel mine is inaccurate, feel free to let me know in the comments below. So at this point, we've come to understand one thing about Kurtz, that he's lost faith in the United States to conduct the war in a manner he deems proper. Later on in the film, we find out from a dossier given to Captain Willard that Colonel Kurtz was by all means an exceptional man. He was third generation West Point, top of his class. It's not said by Willard, but if you pause the movie and read the dossier, it also says he obtained a master's degree from Harvard. His thesis? The Philippines Insurrection, American Foreign Policy in Southeast Asia. He was being groomed for a top position in the military. A general, chief of staff, he could have been anything. But in 1966, he chose to join the Special Forces and return to Vietnam. It's not said in the film, but from this action alone, we can assume that Colonel Kurtz is a man of action rather than one who commands from the rear. We later learn from a letter that he wrote to his son that this is exactly the case. In the letter, he writes that he has been accused of murdering four Vietnamese whom he tracked for several months, accumulating evidence, and found them to be double agents. Rather than going through the proper channels and bringing them to trial, he chose to act of his own accord and mete out justice as he saw fit. He, of course, believes the charges to be unjustified. There are a couple of interesting sentences in this letter that provide us more insight into the mind of Kurtz. He writes, In a war, there are many moments for compassion and tender action, and there are many moments for ruthless action. What is often called ruthless, what may in many circumstances be only clarity, seeing clearly what there is to be done, and doing it, directly, quickly, awake, looking at it. From these sentences, we can now confirm something that is undeniable. Kurtz is a man of action. From the recordings we heard, we can also assume that he'll stop at nothing for victory. Our last stop before getting to Kurtz himself is the ravings of the photographer. For the sake of time, I'm going to tell you all of the important things the photographer has to say about Kurtz now, even though all of this is not said immediately when we first meet him. Most of what the photographer says of Kurtz is blind adulation, calling him a genius, and above him in many ways. But there are a few key things he says about him that are of significance. The first is this quote, Sometimes you'll say hello to him, and he'll walk right by you, and he won't even notice you. And then suddenly, he'll grab you and throw you in a corner, and he'll say, Do you know that if is the middle word in life? If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you. Not only do the colonel's actions show us he is a very temperamental and spontaneous man, but his words here are meant to convey to us a piece of his core philosophy. Keeping yourself on the right path, even while being judged and blamed. This is what Kurtz does. He acts, keeping himself true to what he believes is the best course. Upon coming on severed heads that decorate the steps leading up to the temple, the photographer tells Willard and his men, the heads, you're looking at the heads. Sometimes he goes too far, and he's the first one to admit it. This implies that in some ways, Kurtz is not fully in control of the actions he takes. Whether due to madness or rage, he sometimes takes actions that he later goes on to regret. The last bit of important information we get from the photographer is said to Willard after he's been locked up in a cage. The man is clear in his head, but his soul is mad. He's dying, I think. He hates all this. He hates it. It's this quote, and what Willard later says about Kurtz, that really sends a message. I've never seen a man so broken up and ripped apart. This is the final description of Kurtz in this film that I feel is of any worth. It tells us something that the men higher up in the military could not possibly begin to understand. 
for in their eyes, all Kurtz is doing is mad, unhinged, unsound, evil. For Kurtz, it's necessary, it's right, it's what must be done, yet he is in torment. His mind is not one that does this out of some wanton cruelty. Rather, he does what needs to be done, no matter the cost, whether that be for others or for himself. The rest of this video will be focused on drawing conclusions about the character of Kurtz from the dialogue he provides himself. During Willard's first interaction with Kurtz, the dialogue is mostly personal between Willard and Kurtz. But one thing he says to Willard in this first meeting stands out in particular. Have you ever considered any real freedoms? Freedoms from the opinions of others? Even the opinions of yourself? He's broken free. Kurtz has been freed. Freed from even his own opinion of himself. What you think of him does not matter. What he thinks of himself does not matter. Not especially the voice that surely is in the back of his head, meekly calling to him and judging his actions. None of that matters to him anymore. All that matters is victory. Victory at any cost. Later on, after Kurtz has delivered the severed head of Chef onto Willard's lap, we come to him in the temple reading a very famous poem called The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. We're only given a few lines of the poem by Kurtz, but these lines hold great importance. This poem drew influence from the heart of darkness, among other things. This poem, along with the heart of darkness, were two of the biggest inspirations for the film itself. The lines we hear in the film from Kurtz are the following. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together. Headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass, or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. These lines are meant to give the viewer an accurate depiction of the state Kurtz has devolved into. He has become a shade, a ghost living on the mortal plane an invisible being not fit to ever take form again in the world as we know it. A man whose voice is lost among the throng of the voices of the many. A man who, despite his best efforts, is doomed. The penultimate moment we see Kurtz before his death is perhaps the most pivotal moment in the entire film when it comes to understanding his character. Here, he makes a speech to Captain Willard. I've seen horrors. Horrors that you've seen. But you have no right to call me a murderer. You have a right to kill me. You have a right to do that. But you have no right to judge me. It's impossible for words to describe what is necessary to those who do not know what horror means. Horror. Horror has a face. And you must make a friend of horror. Horror and moral terror are your friends. If they are not, then they are enemies to be feared. They are truly enemies. I remember when I was with special forces. Seems a thousand centuries ago. We went into a camp to inoculate some children. We'd left the camp after we had inoculated the children for polio. And this old man came running after us, and he was crying. He couldn't say. We went back there, and they had come and hacked off every inoculated arm. There they were, in a pile. A pile of little arms. And I remember, I cried. I wept, like some grandmother. I wanted to tear my teeth out. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I want to remember it. I never want to forget it. I never want to forget it. And then I realized, like I was shot, like I was shot with a diamond bullet through my forehead. And I thought, my God, the genius of that, the genius, the will to do that. Perfect, genuine, complete, crystalline, 
secure. And then I realized they were stronger than we. Because they could stand it. These were not monsters. These were men. Trained cadres. These men who fought with their hearts. Who have families. Who have children. Who are filled with love. That they had the strength. The strength to do that. If I had ten divisions of those men, then our troubles here would be over very quickly. You have to have men who are moral, and at the same time, who are able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion, without judgment, without judgment. Because it's judgment that defeats us. Here is where at last we receive the full picture of Colonel Kurtz. A man who would use violence and terror for the sake of the moral greater good. A man torn down to his very core because of the things he feels he must do. For Kurtz is above all, in his eyes, a moral man. Yet morality has abandoned him. His final line of dialogue before his death is a testament to this. We train young men to drop fire on people, but their commanders won't allow them to write obscenities on their airplanes because it's obscene. This is a man who wants to see the success of the institution he gave his life for. A man who has lived with the inefficiency, the inadequacy, and the hypocrisy of that very institution for so long, who has finally become broken and unable to stand it any longer. A man who has seen, felt, and lived horror. And above all, a man who has turned to the very thing he despises in order to fight it. Shattered by all this, this great man who's fallen so far is left with only one thing in his final moments. <laughs>